we're celebrating Seafair. We're celebrating the opportunity to test some new fuels that I think have a great value for this sport and all motorsports. And we're doing it with a driver that is well renowned by everybody in Seattle. I mean, he's an icon as much as the Space Needle and Seattle Center and JP Patches, but in his own right, one of the greatest drivers that Seattle ever produced. I mean, I never would have anticipated driving a boat again, but it was a unique situation. Got a call from Boeing that said, we want to test this biofuel boat. We want you to drive it, what you do it? And I said, sure, as long as I don't have to compete. I have definitely more butterflies doing this just because I feel like I'm out of my element again and it feels all very new again. There's a lot of people looking, so I just don't want to screw up. This may be the last time I get to drive a boat fast, so I'm just trying to enjoy this. What I did driving the Boeing boat was kind of this nice, happy middle ground because driving the boat is fun. I mean, to go that fast and have control over this amazing piece of equipment is, it, it's fun. And it's still fun. The qualities that combine to make Chip Hanauer what he is are the fact that he's very smart and has an incredible amount of courage. He'd go out on the race course, evaluate all the other drivers out there, and then he'd go out and set the world afire. If you watch some of the drives he made, they were absolutely incredible, fearless drives, most cerebral drivers that there ever was. It's a fairly rare combination. I like to believe that I could find unique ways to win. Chip and Joel Muncy are the, are the only boat racers that have ever been elected to the International Motorsports Hall of Fame down in Talladega. We've become friends, he and I, and uh, I have a great deal of respect before I knew him and uh, I respect him even more now because I know him as a man and a human being and he's a great human being. For some reason, the seed of racing was planted in me somehow. I think I became a boat racer simply because I was born in Seattle. And Seattle is kind of a racing desert, except for power boat racing. If you recognize what the boat is capable of and then you watch what Chip did, it was obvious he had an awful lot of talent and he sort of had to prove himself to the boat racing community to get rides in decent boats. Luckily, some people recognized that they thought I had some ability as a driver. Bob Style gave him the ride in the Squire Shop, which was a, a big step up, but not really a front runner. But I think it was during that time that he really got to know Bill and Fran and became Bill's sort of protege. Muncie's stature in the sport of hydroplane racing is unequal. His 62 wins put him far out in front of Chenoweth, his closest rival. And included in those wins are eight gold cups, seven national, and four world championships. And of course, a win in the first thunder on the Ohio. You hire a guy like Chip Hanar? I couldn't get him soon enough. He is everything that a race driver should be, I think. He's able to represent a corporation. He's responsive to the, the general public, which is critical. He talks and responds to media, which is absolutely critical in the support and perpetuation of our sport. He's absolutely got a brilliant future here. Bill Muncy knew that Chip was going to be the next star of the sport. And when Bill Muncy was killed in 1981, it was a huge shock to the sport. So when Fran needed a driver, she went to Chip, and that combination of Chip and the Atlas is really, I think, where he made his legend. He went from being a, you know, one of the young drivers to being the champion and the, kind of the spokesperson for the sport. Bill Muncy had been killed in, in Mexico. And everybody thought the Muncie family and Atlas families were going to leave racing, for sure. I mean, the greatest race driver ever had been killed. And Fran Muncie, his widow, said, no, he would not have wanted this to stop. So they built this boat in 100 days, and we went to the first race, and it was completely uncontrollable. He comes down the backstretch in the Detroit River, and the Atlas is out of shape the whole time. It's walking and pitching and trying to get out of the water. Dean Chenoweth in the, the Griffin-powered Miss Budweiser is driving along beside him like a Mercedes. The thing is so big and heavy, it handles beautifully. Chip knows that if he lets up, he's going to lose that race. And he keeps his foot on the floor, keeps the boat, I won't say on the water because it wasn't, but he kept it going the right direction. I think it's one of the most incredible drives in the history of boat racing. A dream about to come true for Chip Hanauer as he accelerates for the last time across the line and Chip Hanauer has won. He won the Gold Cup with that drive. And I just knew we were going to win. Even though the odds makers would have said you had no chance, the Budweiser had 600 cubic inch engine bigger than ours. Nobody had ever beaten the Griffin in a, really a heads-up race. 
and it happens. It happens at the Gold Cup in Bill's hometown, you know, six months after his death for the Muncie family. It was, it was boat racer heaven. I had my championship, I had my Gold Cup, uh, I had my college education, I'm out of here. And Dean Chenoweth had just died that year in 82, which was like 10 months after Bill Muncie was killed. And I said, I'm not staying here. I got what I wanted, I'm leaving. And that's when we decided to make changes to the cockpits of the boat. And Jim Lacero and I talked and he said, if you'll stay and drive another year, we'll completely redesign the cockpit so that you can actually survive in his belief, I mean, this is all experimental, a cockpit that you can survive crashes in. They used to wear these deceleration chutes so that if you were pitched out of the boat, the chute would pop out and hopefully get you into an attitude where your feet went into the water first. Well, it did that, but then he got tangled up in the parachute. I crashed the boat, and in those days, when you crashed, you died. And I remember being upside down, looking down at Lake Washington, knowing I was dead. And then the next thing, I opened my eyes, and I couldn't believe I was alive. And I saw Mount Rainier, and I thought, oh my God, I survived. And then all of a sudden, I feel this pressure pulling me down. I'm like, oh my God, I survived this accident, and now I'm <laughs> drowned. Squire shop exploded. For Chip to have driven as long as he did, particularly in open cockpit boats, and still be with us, is fairly miraculous. Placed on a stretcher and taken to Welburn Hospital, where he was treated and released. To a degree, I built my career on being able to beat the Budweiser. He has done it. Chip Hanauer taking his seventh consecutive Gold Cup. What I wanted to be the guy that could take a piece of equipment that wasn't as good as the Budweiser, because the Budweiser always had the greatest equipment, and be able to win with it. I've been in and out of the sport a few times. Uh, I retired the first time, I believe, in 1991 and was gone for about three years and then came back and drove for Budweiser. So when I came back to drive the Budweiser, people were upset. None of us fans could believe. This was his nemesis. This was Bill Muncy's nemesis. This boat, uh, you know, fought its whole life against Budweiser. Yeah, it was, I was mad at him for a little while. <laughs> I think a lot of fans were. But I think I got them back then when I came back three years later to drive for the Pico against the Budweiser. And again, beating the Budweiser when nobody thought they could you know, beat them. And my last Gold Cup victory was a real surprise to everybody in, again, an underdog boat against the Budweiser. So it completed the circle. This is the bookend. You know, the, the 82 Gold Cup was, if you will, the first one. And now this with the Pico is, the, you know, probably the last one. And that's how it played out. Fans out here loving what they just saw. It is celebration time, the hits for Chip, the Leland's, the Pico crew, and all of their fans. He basically retired from boat racing and was smart enough to say, okay, I've done what I wanted to do, and I have some other things to do in my life. For me, there was, there was really a big switch in my life between how focused I was on specific goals to just being happy on a day-to-day -day basis. And it came from getting getting ill and basically lost my ability to speak. The worst part of that was I got very depressed to the point that I just didn't want to live anymore. I contracted a neurological disease called spasmodic dysphonia. And what that means is when I think to speak, my brain tells my vocal cords to lock tight. So I virtually can't speak. It's forced to do it. So the only reason I can speak with you today is every three months, uh, Dr. Hillel at the University of Washington lays me on the table and puts a needle in my vocal cord muscles and injects me with Botox. And taught me that, boy, everything you treasure can go totally unexpected for no reason whatsoever. If you're not enjoying what you're doing today, you better change. Do what you really does make you happy. And life was not about individual goals, it was about getting up and enjoying my day. Only things that make me happy on a day-to-day -day basis, spending time with my girlfriend, walking my dog, playing my guitar. Today, I'm all about enjoying the present.